Welcome to the latest Motor One on One interview. I'm your host, MotorOne.com Global Editor in Chief, John Neff. I've known today's guest for almost as long as I've been an automotive journalist. We met early on in our careers, but his was not a career writing about cars. Meet Patrick Colello, the founder, chief designer, and former owner of Automoblox, the toy car company that sold beautifully designed heirloom quality toy cars that were as fun to play with as they were to look at. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, John. You know, I like I said, I have known you almost longer than anyone I've known in this industry, and it's funny because you're you're kind of industry adjacent. You're not an automotive journalist. You we met a very long time ago because you started Automoblox, which, as I mentioned, was this you know incredible toy car company that made these beautiful wooden toys that were creative and you could pull them apart and mix and match them. And I don't even remember. Do you remember when we met and how? I, I Well, early on in Automa Blocks, I, uh, I realized that the automotive uh, press really took a liking to Automa Blocks. So I'm, it must have been at a point where I, w- I had some, autom- uh, some, reach, some reach to the, to the motoring press. I think you and I just got on well, and you really liked the product, and uh, and you became a you know a big fan. And uh, I think that's probably how it happened. If I had to guess, it'd probably be like two thousand five or six, maybe five. Uh, that sounds right to me. Yeah, I think we hit it off because you started on Blocks, and I joined Autoblog really early on, and it kind of felt like our two businesses. Um, grew together, like totally. like kind of at the same pace, and we helped each other a lot. Um, I'll also say that anyone who knows me, and this is true to this day, I love toys. That to- I love the I love the intersection between toys and cars. I love I love anything toy re- toy. I love any toy that's car related. So whether it's RC cars or models or things like that, and I just had never seen anything like Automoblox when we first met. So of course I wanted to write about it. Um, so we wrote about it on Autoblog, and it was was a hit. And you kept um, in touch with me every time you had a new uh, model or or something new to share. We would write about it and. As as much as it helped you, you you sent a, you. I remember back in those days, you sent me a lot of um, a lot of the toy cars um, to use as giveaways. So we would be doing giveaways on Autoblog and, and giving away Automoblox cars to people, and they loved them. And and so yeah, we like I said, we our, our companies kind of grew at the at the same time and the same pace. And so I always felt the kinship with you and was was super happy to keep uh, promoting Automoblox. Now. Um, when, when did Automoblox start? The idea for Automoblox goes all the way back to my college days, way back in the nineties, uh, started working on it as a company right around 99, 2000. We launched some really horribly, horrible quality products in 2004 and, uh, worked out the kinks and we started selling proper products in 05. And I remember Roger Hart from Auto Week was the first person to ever reach out to me. He, I think he saw an ad that we placed in a toy uh, magazine and he said, you know, send me some samples. We want to review them. And at that point, I didn't have samples I wanted to show anybody. So it wasn't until a year later that I had something of quality and sent them to Roger and he wrote like a half page piece on Automoblox. And it was at that point I got to appreciate the power of the press. And what was the what was the effect of that first write up? Oh, we sailed. Boom! It was like you know, money. <laughs> people, <laughs> people called and placed orders. It was it was really great. And um, and I don't remember what we ordered, but uh, you know how much was sold. But I remember it being significant. And at that point, I'm like, I think I'm going to be a PR guy. <laughs> and I started really focusing on the automotive press. And quite frankly, you know, I looked at Automoblox as a car company for kids. I'm a I'm a I'm a car enthusiast. I'm a, I like that. Yeah. Not necessarily a toy guy. Uh, you know, I had what I thought was a great idea, something that resonated with kids and adults, and um, so I really, I probably aligned myself way more with the automotive uh, industry and the automotive uh, publications and journalists than I did with anything in the toy industry. You know, I think you're great at PR, but your background is so varied because you were, I mean, not only were you the owner and founder of Automoblox, you were the designer as well. I mean, isn't, isn't, wasn't that part of your background too? I mean, what was your, what was your schooling in? So I studied industrial design, a bit of graphic design and business. 
Um, I think I always know, knew I wanted to be in business and be an entrepreneur. And I think it, I think it takes a certain kind of person to be an entrepreneur. Sure. I'm, I'm certainly not the first one that said that, but it's a certain kind of person for sure. Um, so, um, I mean, this was an idea, you know, it started out as a college project and, uh, I went to Carnegie Mellon and Carnegie Mellon had a, uh, a psychology department and part of really the impetus of Automa Blocks was to teach kids creative thinking. And I wanted to make sure that my products had that built into them. And I worked very hard at creating not just a car, but a puzzle system that really challenged kids in a cognitive way. And I, I initially started with the psychology department at, um, at Carnegie Mellon, which had a, a, a preschool that had like a one way mirror and stuff. So I don't know what they were doing with these kids when I wasn't there, but they allowed me to go in and, <laughs> and give the kids some toy samples that were you know, just very crude models. And it was the response that, that uh, I got from these, these, you know, four year olds um, on very crude models and how positive it was. I was like, wow, maybe there's something here. And uh, it wasn't until, you know, seven or eight, eight years later that I wound up doing something. But um, I was fascinated by, um, by the response um, so I'm a trained product designer, and I've always had a kind of a business mind. And uh, Automo Blocks really became almost like a, a real-world uh, MBA um, in order to take a product, um, take a product and turn it into a company in the business. Um, is certainly quite an effort. And um, well, and I, I remember you telling me. Um other parts of the business, like, you know, there's manufacturing, there's, there's quality control. There's, you know, when you, when you become an entrepreneur, you're suddenly the, the chair of eight different departments and you're in your little company as it's growing. Uh, what was that like as Automobile Blocks grew from, you know, a few products to a whole, I mean, how many, how many different vehicles were you selling by the end or different SKUs, like dozens, right? I think the most we have was somewhere in the mid thirties. Yeah. Um, at some point you rationalize and pare down, but that's something you learn. Um, you know, managing inventory and all those kinds of things. Uh, but no, it's very interesting doing all the jobs, right? Uh, I think to be an entrepreneur, you need to be good at a lot of things, great at a few, but good at most things, kind of like everything, right? Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, you got to like just basically take your hat off and put a different hat on. You could be the supply chain guy one minute, the marketing guy another minute, the designer another minute, uh, the CEO another minute, um, you know, working with, you know, securing financing to, um, negotiating contracts and uh, and vetting suppliers like those are all kind of normal things that that go on in the day in the day in life of an entrepreneur and of course as you grow you can hire people in each of those different disciplines to make uh, your life easier and in the end make a better company and a better yeah, product. But- Somebody's got to do it first, and it's usually the the guy who started it, right? One one of my favorite things at at one point the uh, my desk was literally in my bedroom. <laughs> so if I forgot to put my computer, uh, you know, on to sleep, I'd get chimes, you know, the email would be chiming all night long. And, uh, you know, sometimes a commute can be a little bit too short, right? Go from the oh, oh to the, believe me, I know. I work from home as well. So that that's definitely a challenge. And, uh, you know, I'm doing business with Europe, with, with Asia. So you could work all day long. And a lot of times that wound up happening. But I remember one time getting a call. I remember sitting at my desk and I had a young, I had a baby at the time. And answering the call, and the baby's crying in the background. And I'm, I told the call, I said, "Don't mind the baby. We're doing focus groups today." I mean, it's just <laughs> like you just kind of, kind of roll with what you have. And, Great cover, yeah, and, like uh, that. Yeah, and just, and just do what you got to do to get the job done. You know, you mentioned that you looked at Automobile Blocks like a car company for kids. One of the fam- one, one of my favorite things that you and I did together was you came to me when you had a new model you were launching, and you wanted to make it like it was a real car, and 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 pretend like we took spy shots of it. Yeah. So you, you fed me these like, you know, these spy shots of a little toy car uh, and we ran them like normal, normal spy shots. And we did it like totally straight. Like this was, you know, like a GM spy shot or something like that. Um, I, I love that kind of creativity. That was really fun. Love that. So other people have done it since then. And I, I just, in the toy industry, uh, listen, I, I, as a kid, like my favorite part of the magazine was always the, the, the you know, the beginning and looking at the spy shots and the futuristic cars. Like that was my thing. Dude, I love, have we love, talked love. about that before? Because I, I, on this podcast, I have literally said those exact same words. That no, my we, favorite we part have of the car not. Like that, like, and I would try to like figure out like, like my dream job at one point in my life was I want to be the guy that disguises the cars. Like that would yeah. be like my dream job. It's like, how much cladding do I put on? What kind of wrap? 
like, and you think about it, it's got to create buffeting and wind noise and it's going to wreck the fuel economy and the drag. So, you yeah. know, so, uh, that's like my favorite, favorite thing is future cars. And I think it goes back to, uh, I remember being a little boy. I think my dad became an automotive enthusiast when he got a brand new 1976 BMW 2002, which, mm. which of course was a beautiful car to drive right. back then. And, and obviously a groundbreaking automobile. Um, and I remember him, him taking me to auto shows as a child and uh, looking at these cars on the turnstile, these futuristic concept cars, probably, if I had to guess, I'd probably say in the late 70s, early 80s. Mm-hmm. And I remember tugging on my dad's shirt and like, Dad, why can't they make this car now? And wow. that was always my fascination. And when I went to college, um, went to, uh, I remember being in the, um, in the library and uh, discovering this magazine called Car Styling. And... I, just my mind being blown, like absolutely being blown. I'm, I'm sure you've seen that publication. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, just looking at uh, all these concept cars and, and learning about the design development and, and looking at prototypes and drawings and clay models. And that just totally blew my mind. And at that point, I was like, I'm going to be a car designer. I'm going to art center and I'm going to be a car designer. Man, I, the dude, I, I totally wanted to be a car designer growing up too. And I, I had designs on it going into high school and it didn't work out. I always tell a story that ends up uh, blaming my art teacher in high school, even though it's probably not really his fault. But uh, <laughs> it was the same way. I thought car design was the coolest thing. And my story is I remember going to, I think it was the 1985 auto show in Cleveland. Um, and the, the new 1986 Ford Taurus w- had debuted and it was like a spaceship, the spaceship. And it was like the most futuristic thing I'd ever seen. Um, and I became enamored with it. And I think that's why the, the 91 Taurus SHO is, has become like, I, that's my, like one of my favorite cards of all time. Um, but I, I just remember that car. It didn't look like any other car. It yep. looked so, uh, so ahead of its time. And that kind of like, you know, um, put me down that path. And then I remember watching an, an episode of Quantum Leap. Scott Bakula leaped into, I think he leaped into the body of a secretary of a car designer. But oh my in, God. This, in this episode, you got to see like a, a car design office in an automaker in like the 60s. And I thought it was, I'm like, oh my God, it's a real job. It's a real job. <laughs> and I Amazing. wanted to, I, I immediately wanted to be it. So, um, but but yeah, it didn't work out. But you you got to design cars. You got and, well. And, and, I, I looked at it like I was designing real cars, right? And and you know, I think the the beauty of Automoblox is really the simplicity of it. And I think it's it's very. You can look at cars on the road today. It's very easy for a designer to be heavy handed. Sure. Um. So. There's but that's quite- what that's what the Automoblox cars you designed were. They were like you you you. So I remember you had a coupe, a sedan, um, an SUV. But they were like the um, the essence of each of those vehicle types. Precisely, right? Precisely, precisely. So I call at one point I called them concept cars for kids. I basically created I created automotive categories, and I just wanted to create the essence of that the, the that wheel, category the, that the vehicle wheel, type the wheelbase the height the silhouette of that category so it was very simple there was very minimal adornment on the actual body of the vehicle so it was a very simple clean elegant very little detail to the shape to the wooden body all the detail was put in the in the wheels the tire treads yes and then late, and then later the brembo brakes so, so yeah, the, that was the, a great, um, a great partnership you had, um, at near, near the end of your run with Automo Blocks, the Brembo brakes, oh my uh, God. just the perfect amount of realism and, and to make it feel like a real car to have like a real part that you can see on actual cars was a nice touch. Yeah. So it was just the, it's the juxtaposition of that reality against that very, very clean, basic conceptual minimalist. So it's, I think it's a contrast of not only the materials and the colors, but the, the design approach, right, to those details and to that very simplistic body, I think that's part of what made um, the aesthetic so dynamic. I like the colors, too. I don't think you should uh, pass over that uh, so quickly because unlike most people, um, you know, kids probably played with their automobile blocks. I did not play with them. Mine were for display. And I will put I will put some pictures of uh, my last home office where I had them all on display. You've sent me a lot of them over the years. Um, and I had the entire rainbow of the mini automobile blocks, probably oh, cool. like 15 to 20 of them all in rainbow order. 
Um, oh, that's and, cool. and I had them displayed around my office in very, in various places. Some of the larger ones, you had a hot rod series, uh, that I had the big and the little one for each. Oh, wow. and, and those were great too. Um, so my office was, was automobile blocks HQ for many, many years. Um, I, well, I used to call them, sometimes I'd call the, uh, I'd, it was like uh, candy for the brain because it was like, they, they had these candy colors and you really want to touch them and reach out to them. And, yeah. uh, it's one of those deals that it's almost like giving kids broccoli that tastes delicious. So, uh, it's just <laughs> well, like they, they, it was good for them, but they didn't realize it was good for them. Right. I when I, when our, my nieces and nephews would come visit me, I would either close my office door because they, that's what they are. They're candy. The colors of them like draw kids in. I would either close my office door and not let them in. Or if they walked in, like I would have to be with them and, and their parents understood like, you know, Uncle John's toys aren't for playing. They're for looking. And so I would like monitor them. So I, I probably treated them. Uh, not in the way you meant them to be treated. No, you, you should have called me. I would have given you a whole box just for the kids, <laughs> a little play box. I think, oh, well, I got, you know what? I'm sure I passed them along to them at some point. And I, cause I know I got them for birthday gifts for, for them as well. Um, and, and for me, I actually, I got to tell you, for me, I, I've probably gifted, uh, more than half of my collection away, especially the large ones. I, I often, like, like I remember uh, later days in Autoblog, we had uh, redesigned the site. It was like the fourth redesign of the site. And it was a really hard project, many months long. And I brought down like, uh, you know, six of the of the full size automobiles and gave them away as gifts to the developers and the project managers who worked on it. Um, and yeah, so I've often used them as like um, gifts for people, adults, you know, just like here. Um, and I think people people know they're friends of mine if they've if they've received an automobile blocks from me oh that's cool that's awesome so, so um one the, kind of uh, leading to the end of your of your tenure with uh, automo blocks and my tenure with autoblog um something really interesting and cool happened when i left autoblog um which was around 2014 um, and I had, I, I had left a lot of great colleagues and friends at, at Autoblog and some of them got in contact with you, um, to kind of, you know, get me a, a I guess a going away present. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that went down and what yeah. resulted from it? Do you remember, uh, what was the gentleman, the guy's name who, uh, uh Chris Pauker probably right. contacted Chris, Chris you. Chris yeah. contacted me and he, and he said, you know, John's leaving Autoblog. We want to give him a special going away gift. Is there something special that you have? And and I started thinking about it. And what I wound up doing, um, I want, really wanted to create something super special, like a one-off, handmade. In the end, it was kind of expensive, but it was. I'm so glad I did it. Um, so I decided to uh, – Autoblog's blocks bodies are made of wood, but I decided to do a billet aluminum bodied car that had um, that that in essence replaced the wood with aluminum and had it highly polished and it probably weighs like a ton and then put all the plastic automobile box parts in it and I think I think that car even had the prototype uh, Brembo brakes yes uh, I'll have to go off the shack I'll put pictures of it um, on the website uh, and in the show notes uh, of this episode and we'll see yeah I, I don't I, I don't remember them off the top of my head with the Brembo brakes I remember some of the later ones you sent me after that had the Brembos maybe yeah maybe I wanted to do it and couldn't figure out how to do it but I, the, I, I think the request came in a transition period when we were refreshing the line and one of the things we added to the new models was Brembo brakes and uh, and HRE wheels, and, um, and I think I wanted to sort of incorporate those if I could. Um, but yeah, no, it was you know I think there was some kind of well, and let me explain the amount of I now I don't know firsthand, but the amount of time and effort, and like you said, probably money that went into this is incredible because it took I think over a year for you to create. I think I think what if I could if I can recall I think the problem we had was the finish because I wanted the polish right aluminum. the polish finish and I think something happened with the finish and I had to take it had to take it out to like an automotive polisher that finally got it correct because wow. I, I had a couple a couple places that now we don't want to touch it I can't do it so I found some guy in Long Island I think that wound up polishing it and getting the finish just right I think are the wheels aluminum too I think the wheels are aluminum too. 
Um, again, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, I'll check and, and put those in the show notes uh, if they are. I, I will say the so the the body is extremely heavy. I mean, it is it is like a solid ingot of of aluminum, uh, but still able to be pulled apart in the the three sections like any automobile blocks. Um, and yeah, it weighs a ton. It's gorgeous. Um, I wish it, I had one. It is. <laughs> you should have made two. Uh, and keep in mind, like, like, I, so I leave Autoblog, and Chris tells me, like, "Oh, we got you a gift," but and Patrick's helping us with it, but it's being worked on. So o- almost like at the about a year later, I've I've completely forgotten about this, and in the mail, I get this box that again weighs a ton and I pulled this out. You made an acrylic display case for it as well. Oh, did I? So, oh my gosh. That's yes, awesome. It is. And, and I got to say, I, I, again, I'll show pictures of my last home office that I had totally decorated and stuff. It is like the, the crown jewel of the office. It is. Everything is like built up to it and, and it, it had a place of honor and it still does. I mean, it's, it's literally the best gift I've, I've ever gotten. And the coolest thing, um, I think I own and I'm excited wow. to actually talk about it and share it because I don't think, I don't think I've ever really shared this. Really, this, this cool. I haven't talked about it much, uh, certainly not like publicly. So it'd be, it'd be kind of cool to show people, um, um, this, this amazing thing. Um, and yeah, I, God, it 10 pounds, maybe like it, <laughs> it is seriously solid. Like, like I said, like a, like a silver ingot. Um, but yeah, so so that's when I left Autoblog. And then your tenure with Automobile Blocks um, eventually came to an end to a couple, uh, what, about a couple years ago, maybe? Yeah, it was the uh, summer of uh, 16. So so you eventually sold Automobile Blocks to another company and moved on to kind of your next uh, project, right? Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. It's called Honda Vintage Culture. Yeah, so I'm a obviously a huge automotive enthusiast and also a, a huge Honda enthusiast. And, um, and I, I, I over the years I, I gained many friends in the industry and, uh, and some of the folks, uh, that I was became friends with were the people in the licensing department at, uh, at American Honda. And, uh, so we were talking about some, some ideas and I said, I really love to do like a, like an enthusiast, a premium enthusiast line for Honda. I feel like it's something they don't have. And uh, one thing led to another, and uh, after a long gestation period, we negotiated a contract, and I launched a line of vintage-inspired uh, apparel that celebrates the innovative soul of Honda Motor and its motorsports excellence. And uh, I feel like since Honda is such a successful mass-market brand, not enough people really know about how special they really are from a uh, innovation and 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 really racing uh, from the racing side, so I'm using the uh, th- this format, this temp- this format of uh, apparel to kind of educate educate people on, on how and why Honda is so special. You know, I, I didn't know um, how. Like, of course, I knew Honda has been in motorsport a long time, but you came to me at some point. And and asked me about um, photos from the history of Honda's racing, and it just so happens that the company that uh, owns Motor One uh, Motorsport Network um, also has a very large archive of motorsport photography. And through that, um, we were able to find you some photos of, I think it was Honda's F1 like pit crew team, like way back in the day. I don't even know what year yeah. it was. Yeah. So, so my, the, some of the first items I produced were jackets that were inspired by, by Honda pit uniforms from the, from the middle 1960s, middle and late 1960s. And if you think about the context of a, of a Japanese manufacturer going to Europe, um, in the '60s, and competing at the highest level of motorsports, competing with uh, Ferrari and Maserati, and uh, what else? He had Lotus probably at that time, Damn. and uh, and then just going there with like, you know a bunch of Japanese guys like show up and and try to get this car on the track and compete. I mean, it's it's it's, unbe- it's an unbelievable story. Um, I think it's a testament to Mr. Honda's vision, his his uh, his you know his, his courage and his his kind of like not afraid to do anything attitude and uh and this guy loved racing and it was such a big deal and you know i think within 
14 or 15 months, they won their first Grand Prix, which was just oh, yeah. unreal. That's amazing. Um, so the, your your website for this is at uh, vintageculturestyle.com. Uh-huh. Uh, and that's where people can check out this this full line of apparel. That's um, There's a lot of great uh, T-shirts, but also some uh, really cool jackets. Uh, and of course, you know, like always, you sent me some samples um, and I love them. And in particular, um, there's uh, one of the jackets. It's a it's a kind of a gray jacket. It's labeled as Honda Motor Zipper Jacket on the website. It's uh, $65, which I find in- incredibly uh, reasonable for, for how much I have liked this jacket. And let me tell you, I have. So so when I'm wearing it out, it's, it's a light like spring or fall jacket. And the, the most recent time I was actually in New York City on vacation with my family and I, I got stopped on the street where usually it was like young guys who would like just say, hey, nice jacket. <laughs> like, I'm, <laughs> like I am not someone known for my uh, apparel or my wardrobe. So this to me is an extremely shocking experience to have somebody compliment me on what I'm wearing. Great story. Uh, it's funny. Yeah. I, I, and what I really like about it, I, again, I don't, I don't know clothes from one thing or another, but um, the, the shoulders, and I, this is such a weird thing to notice, just the shoulders are like really well cut. Um, and they have this, I don't know, just kind of way of, of making my shoulders look bigger <laughs> maybe that, than they yeah. are, but it's just a really good cut. Um, yeah. So, so all, all the, you know, we're not just sticking logos on stuff and, you know, just exactly. Stuff, yeah. We're, all, all the stuff that we produce is bespoke. So that's, you know, I'm picking the fabrics and the cuts and, and the sizing and, uh, and it's all, you know, it's got our own branding. It's, it's every detail is designed from the, from the zipper pulls to the, to the woven labels. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's not something that, that, you know, other brands do this, but I think, um, in the automotive space, it's not as common, you know, you have it at, you know, at BMW and, and, and Porsche, but you don't usually have it at a brand like Honda, but quite frankly, uh, you know, I, I would challenge any other automotive brand that has, I don't think anybody has a uh, history that could rival Honda motor, um, with, with their, with, with what they've done in motorsports. I mean, there's, I don't think there's any other company that makes jets, robots and formula one cars. Um, it's, <laughs> and lawnmowers and generators and yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's absolutely staggering and and uh, the quality, the innovation, and uh, you know, I, I generally collect Honda products that are that tend to be sports cars, but you know, through the course of their history, they've made some outstanding, class leading sports cars that are now automotive icons and not even arguably are some of the best cars ever made um, that, that, that are on lists of, of some of the best cars ever made, which is, what, which is pretty so, exciting. Uh, what are some of the Hondas you've owned? So I've actually owned, if you count them all up, I think I'm on number 30-something Honda. Oh, my God. <laughs> so don't go through the whole list. Yeah. So what are the been highlights? Quite, it's been quite a few. So my very first car was a 1988 CRX that I had new. And, mm. and and quite frankly, it was that car that made me fall in love with the brand. You know, is that the car on the t-shirts? Uh, Cause I noticed your, your, your two newest t-shirts um, are based on the CRX from 88. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going back to, I'm going back to 88. And that's, that's nice. one of the reasons why that, that's, that's like the first car model shirt I've made. I've gone back to 88 because for me, that's where it all started. And that car was very special. It was a great value, great performance car. And once again, it was a car that um, kind of appealed to a broad, broad base of people. And I think brought new people into the brand because it was, it was sporty, stylish, innovative, great value and, and, sure. fuel, and fuel efficient and an engineering marvel with a double wishbone suspension. Um, I'm trying to think what other great innovations, but the car was just phenomenal. Um, so that car kind of hooked me into the brand. But so to this day, I, you know, I own five Honda models today. Um, wow. I, I own, and most of them I've owned a very long time. I've owned, I have a Acura NSX that I've owned for 20 years. Wow. So I have a, uh, a Honda S2000, a 2001 Honda S2000 I've owned for 11 years. I have a, uh, a Honda CRX that's highly modified. It's uh, it's crazy modified. I, I always wanted to do sort of a tuner car, but in a tasteful Colello style. Is so, that the is that the white one on the homepage of the Vintage yeah. Culture Style website? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that's very. Uh, it's classic, man. It's very tasteful. It's very clean. It's, yeah. it's it's radical modifications, but it's super clean. You wouldn't really know it. It's got a move and body kit, which is like the holy grail of uh, of aftermarket parts. 
I think, uh, I think beat up used ones go for eight grand now. Wow. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's a great car. I have also the other Holy Grail is I have a 1997, um, Acura Integra type R. Oh, very nice. Jeez. Of which, of which they made like 300 or so that year. And, uh, I've just completed a full, I'll call it an underbody restoration. So I've replaced every nut and bolt under the car, repowder coated suspension brakes, um, new bushings all around, uh, detailed the engine bay. And, uh, yeah, the car is just a phenomenal, super clean, wonderful car. And then I have an everyday driver, which is a 2018 Civic Type R. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is, I mean, you've proven your, your Honda uh, enthusiast credentials. That is, I mean, that's the highlight of the brand over the last 30 years, really. Um, you, yeah, you so, so, so it's that. So, it's, so, so the, all those cars wouldn't exist if Honda didn't have that, that motorsport soul, the soul of innovation that, you know, the Honda rotates engineers through their formula one program so they can learn. So it's really a teaching tool for them as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, so without, without racing, there is no Honda and there, there are no great sports cars. So, um, so that's, what's exciting. And that's why motorsports is, uh, Honda Motorsports, I think, is so exciting. Obviously, the U.S., we do a lot of things in the U.S., too, which are also very exciting. Um, I particularly am a crazy Formula One fan, so um, so Honda having just won their first Grand Prix in 13 years is super exciting and uh, to certainly on the right track to, to doing some great things with Red Bull. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, well, so that leads me into your, your what's next for you. Um, the vintage culture seems to be going well. You're, you're coming out with new um, apparel and expanding the line. Um, are you going to keep going with this for a while? Do you have something on the horizon if you're able to talk about it? Yeah, so I think with uh, with vintage culture, there's a lot. Uh, you know, Hans and I are actually looking to work even closer together. I think there's a lot of great things we can do. You know, you know, part of uh, everything I'm doing with vintage culture, I'm doing with the intent of of of, of obviously creating a, six, a successful brand um, for myself, but also helping Honda almost from a from an image and marketing standpoint. I wanted to to look favorably upon them. And to sort of open people's eyes up to really how special this brand is. So a lot of the things I'll be doing in the future with Vintage Culture are, is going to be underscoring all the different facets of the Honda business and and why they're so successful. So I, I think we definitely have some legs here. Um, I'm also working on a project that's outside of automotive and outside of design. It's an entertainment property, which is very different, but it's very innovative. And I think... Uh, Really, this, the the essence of I believe um, my some of my core strengths are really you know innovation, and uh, and I think this uh, this project certainly very challenging and pretty exciting. So hopefully you'll you'll be learning about it in the coming years. Great, I will of course be eager to hear. Um, and I want to thank you for for being on the podcast with me and having this great conversation. We've been friends for a long time, and I'm sure we will for a, a long time into the future. Um, so thanks for having this talk with me. Um, I appreciate it, John. Thanks so much for having me. It's of course. Honor. And if you guys want to follow Patrick and Vintage Culture, um, you can find him on Instagram at Honda Vintage Culture. Um, so go ahead and, uh, and follow him there. And of course, um, if you like the Motor One podcast, we have new episodes coming out every Friday. Um, and you can find us on iTunes and Google Play and anywhere uh, where you find your podcast to listen to. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll talk to you next time.